الله وملائكته وكتبه ورسوله واليوم الآخر والقدر خيره والشره من الله والبعث بعد الموت السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I wanted to start off with uh, some celebrity gossip but uh, يعني I couldn't find anything worth uh, discussing most of the time it's not worth discussing right but it's just that a lot of times people take celebrities as role models they look up to them they look up to athletes they look up to all kinds of uh, so I wish I had some Justin Berber information for you <laughs> but I don't have anything for you um, one thing I found was the the guy who uh, who created Facebook got married yeah isn't that great yeah and they, they're like oh he changed his status on Facebook to married like, why do I care Good for him. Okay. Type. Uh, so basically, let's uh, skip the celebrities because uh, they're not the types of role models we want to talk about anyway. So they're, they're the wrong role models. And so we're going to just skip those guys. Uh, so basically, for, for our purposes, we want to look at a role model and we want to define the role model as people who possess qualities that we would like to have. All right. And typically, when someone has a quality you would like to have, you make an effort to have the same quality in yourself. You try to be like that individual. And I know people, uh, they, they, they want to insist that uh, you can only have the Prophet ﷺ as a role model. And of course, he is the best role model. He is the ultimate role model. But you can have other role models in life. That's the reality. So realistically, we have many other, many role models, but we know who is the best out of all of them. Yeah. So uh, someone that possesses a quality that we would like to have ourselves and so in that sense we would like to be like them and it's, it's possibly it's a good quality for sure. So it's a good quality and we'd like to emulate that good quality. Not every flaw that they have. We don't want to like comb our hair the way they comb their hair. But we just want to emulate them in that one thing. So they can be a role model in that sense. And or, or it could be someone that has uh, affected us in a way that makes us want to become better people. So a lot of times you find uh, students who study with a scholar in that sense and in that limited sense the that scholar is a role model and that's why you, many times you find students speak the exact same way like the sheikh speaks because they were affected by them in that way um, but you know something most people are or will be role models at some point in their life and if you're a parent you're automatically a role model you're, if you're a mother or you're a father you automatically became a role model because your children look up to you and they, they, they want to be like you and to them you're superheroes and there's absolutely nothing that you can't do and the effect that parents have on a child are incredible so when you first open your eyes your role models are your parents even if they do something bad you don't know any better one of my friends and he's uh, and we don't overpraise him in the sight of Allah but he's a religious guy he's got a huge gigantic beard but he knows soccer in incredible detail He's the only person I've met in my life that will tell you about soccer events by the date first. He'll tell you laws that FIFA passed and he'll tell you what year the law was passed. And like, why do you know soccer so well? He said it was 1980 something and it was the World Cup. And I was a, a little boy in the living room and the World Cup game was going on. I don't know if it was the final or something. He said one team scored a goal and my father, who was like, a very stoic man and he didn't show a lot of reactions and he was very serious and people respected him everyone in the neighborhood respected him and I haven't ever seen him jump up and down and act crazy this is my father a very calm man when that goal came he flew out of the sofa and yelled so he said if this sport makes my dad a great man in his, his eyes jump like that and yell like that this absolutely must be something great this is something superb and from that day on, he loves soccer until now. Still makes time for soccer, memorizes dates, knows which player is which. And then he does his Islamic studies as well, his dawah as well, and his school work as well. But just to show you the effect that fathers have on their children and mothers as well. 
So when I was young, I remember my father could outrace anybody. My father could beat up anybody. My father could beat up any one of your fathers. <laughs> when I was young, and with all due respect. And now I myself, I'm a father, and my son thinks I can beat up everybody. And he's right. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. Okay. <laughs> so, and fathers know it all, don't they? Fathers know it all. <laughs> even I remember, like, if uh, like some of our friends, it's not even like childhood now, we're talking about high school. And if one of them had a book on a hadith, and then his father told him that hadith is weak, he just took it that it's weak. <laughs> his father doesn't know anything about a hadith. But my dad said that hadith is weak. Like, okay. What's your last name? Is it Bukhari? What's your last name? <laughs> what does your dad know about? But hey, my dad said so. Fathers know everything, don't they? Well, at least when you're young. Then you get to a point when you think you know better than they do, and you still don't. But when you're young, the father knows everything. And this reminds me of uh, the joke of uh, the boy who was asking his father religious and fiqh questions. So he says, Dad, where do we put our hands when we come up from ruku' On the chest or by our sides? The father thinks about it. He says, well, I don't know. So he says, okay, Dad, can you say bismillah when you enter into the bath, when you're making wudu in the bathroom? Can you say bismillah because you're in the bathroom? The father thinks about it. He says, well, I, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. He says, okay, uh, does the woman have to cover her feet Islamically? The father says, well, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. So then the son says, okay, one more question. He says, how about, uh, like, the, is it sunnah or wajib to grow a beard? The father thinks about it. says, I don't know. Then the mother sees all this. She interrupts. She says, boy, stop harassing your father. Leave him alone. The father says, no, no, no. Let the boy benefit. So, so parents, whatever you like, your children like. Whatever you do, they do. However you behave, they imitate, and they learn by imitating. So that's why when you pick up the phone, you say hello, your child picks up phones, plastic phones, and they say hello. They do whatever you do. That's how they're learning everything around them. That's how they're learning how to interact with the world around them and with, with other human beings as well. So if you have a temper, your child will have a temper. So if you hit, your child will hit. And if you curse, your child will curse as well. And it's sad that a lot of times parents teach their children bad manners when they're little kids. So I, and I had a friend of mine, he would always teach his son to be aggressive. Always tell him, go hit. And if everything, there's a cat, go hit it. Da dog, go, yeah, why are you teaching him that? Why don't you teach him to be gentle? No, no, so he's not afraid. Okay. And he wasn't Sudanese either. And in Sudan, and I have to admit this, in Sudan we're very cruel to animals. Very cruel to animals. You know? So... <laughs> You go in some parts of the world, okay, for example, I'll tell you, in Sudan, you will never ever see a cat on the, on the ground. Cats are always up on a wall. They're very high, far, because people hurt them. Yeah, and you can be busy going to an emergency, and if you see a cat, you have to stop and pick a rock and throw it at it. <laughs> a lot of cruelty like that. You have to pick a rock, throw it at a dog, at a cat. So the cat, whenever it sees you, like if, if, you're, if I'm here and the cat is at the end of the room, when it sees me, it just runs like I'm racing after it. Because people hurt them. I visited this one country in the Caucasus regions, and cats basically, we were in a tourist street, and there are many people walking and going, and cats would just be walking like that. You know? And being Sudanese, I wanted to like, what's this cat doing on the floor? No, I'm kidding, I love cats. <laughs> but, not to be taken. Taken from our topic, Annie. But the point is, a lot of cruelty. I remember one time my dad took me to the zoo when I was a young boy in Sudan, and, uh, and there was a fox in a small cage, and there were like 15 school children, and each one had like five or six little rocks in their hand, and this little fox in this little cave, and they're like, oh, oh, <laughs> That was Sudanese. They're like, give, give him. He's like, get him. He's over on your side. And, we go to the zoo to like beat up animals, like what kind of cruelty is this, you know? We killed the hippopotamus in Sudan. People threw coke bottles at it and stuff, it swallowed them. It died. Okay, how do we get to cruelty? Somebody help me out here. The elephant? If the elephant died, the zoo there is basically like they give you boxing gloves with your ticket, go ahead. Then. Beat the animals up. That's the entertainment. Okay, I don't know how we got to animal cruelty all of a sudden. What was I talking about before? 
Awa, imitating your parents. Thank you very much. Someone's a, so basically, this friend of mine, he just teaches his son to be aggressive and, and violent. And, and when he was a little boy, barely able to walk, like hit, hit, hit. He's just hitting things, smacking things left and right. Then he gets a little older, three or four, and then he comes to complain to me. This boy is so violent. I don't know what to do with him. Well, you're talking like you're surprised, like you don't know why he's violent. What were you teaching him all this time? You were teaching him to be violent. You were teaching him to hit so as not to be scared of things. Is that the only option? Like either I beat it or I'm afraid of it. I can't like it. There's nothing in the middle. So, so the role model, he had a, a clean slate, a perfect opportunity to mold and shape his son the way he wanted to. And he taught him bad manners. And so many times a parents think that, or some fathers will think it's a manly thing to teach your child to say bad words or be aggressive or to spit. A little child doesn't know how to spit, go spit on this person. And the child's spitting at everything. And in the end, they, they spit at the parents when they yell at them, when the little child, yani. So, the, the opportunity with this clean slate is to mold it in any way that you want, in the best way. And take, take advantage of that. And you mold the child in the best way because you're the role model at this moment. And that's why when you look at the wise man, Luqman, Luqman, he gave excellent advice to his son. And he gave him advice concerning his belief, his, his uh, aqidah, not to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to how to deal with his parents, to even little things in the heart. He's telling him, even if it's a mustard seed and it's in a rock or in the heavens or in the earth, Allah will, will bring it forth so that you can't hide anything from Allah. So internally, he's concerned with him, akhlaq wise, you know. And from his advice, and he tells him to not walk uh, arrogantly around the, the, on the earth, to not raise his voice. He says, him, and he tells him, وَلَا تُسَعِّرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ so basically, do not like turn your, your face away from people in arrogance. Which is very interesting to Sa'ir. Sa'ar is a disease that afflicts camels. And when this disease afflicts the camel, it turns the camel's neck and its face. So the camel always looks like this. And it's just amazing that he gives this comparison. Because how do arrogant people walk? I'll give you a demo. <laughs> Let me show you how they don't walk. Walk. They don't walk with their head straight. They don't walk straight like this. How do arrogant, tough guys walk? <laughs> exactly. They turn, they, they come like this. <laughs> Always. <laughs> just like the ayah said, just like the camel disease. You know? So if they're walking like this, they find a diseased camel, they'll think the camel's down with them. They'll be like, what's up? <laughs> camel will be like, Arr. You know, they'll have a connection immediately. You know? <laughs> Opportunity. So this child is young. What are you going to do? And you're the role model at the moment yeah and it may be like it might be um, a little overwhelming you know I thought the, I thought there was something wrong with me when my son was born because you know these people are very emotional some people like when my, when my son was born it was the, the happiest moment in my life and I was emotional and, and then these fathers who faint and the, the wife is screaming when she and they're like oh honey and stuff I was like yeah get even now this is for what you've done to me you know it's a chance to, for payback. Anyways, the point is, uh, when the child was born, when I didn't feel any of that, oh, it's just great fatherhood. And I was like worried. I'm like, Allah, this is a problem now. I have to be this little guy's role model. And he has to look up to me and I have to do everything proper. And I would say that my father, alhamdulillah, he was proper. You know, I never saw him do something stupid. I never saw him dance at a party, jump up and down, you know, shake his hip. Or, Alhamdulillah. And I think that would have traumatized me to see my father do something like that. And I always feel bad for people that their, their parents go up and dance at a party and stuff. And like, hey, isn't that your mom and dad? Like, yeah, they're dancing. Shouldn't you be in a hole somewhere right now? <laughs> it's embarrassing, you know? So, like, my concern was like, okay, now I'm a role model for this guy. I have to do everything right, you know, and you just have to. It's a responsibility, but that's the truth. They look up to you. Whatever you do, they want to do. Whatever you like, they like. When I was young, anything my dad liked, I liked it. Anything. And we watch pro wrestling. Any wrestler he support, I was on his side. Yes, you support that. I'm with you on that wrestler. Every time. Never once did I support the opponent. It's your dad. That's how it works. How about mothers? Mothers are role models as well. Fantastic role models. They can have great influence on people. My favorite example of a fantastic mother, I always like to give the example of the mother of Imam Malik, rahimahullah. 
And she's such a brilliant woman because we know that Imam Malik, when he was a young boy, he actually wanted to become a singer. And if he wants to become a singer, that means all day he's going to be singing, okay, practicing his voice, writing poetry, um, and for song purposes, not like uh, Brother Ammar. <laughs> he's going to write poetry like for song purposes. He's going to hang out with, with uh, people who, you know, um, you know, melodies and instruments, maybe take up an instrument to learn. So then his actions are going to be like that the whole time. And to change those actions now, it's going to be difficult. Well now, and years later, psychologists explain to us how to do that. Actions are linked to a goal. So to change their action, you have to change their goal. So his goal is to become an, a singer. Every, all his actions will be linked to that. So she didn't nag him about his actions. She basically readjusted his goals because she was brilliant. And she basically made him want to become a scholar. And she would dress him up like a young scholar, which is really, really amazing. She would dress him up like a little sheikh. And sometimes it would be too dark for him to go to, for Fajr to the masjid. She would walk with him, take him to the masjid. But I love the fact that she dressed him up like a little sheikh. You know, we do this to our children all the time. Not sheikh though. You know, we dress them up like the, you know, we got, buy them the kit from the dollar store. It's got the plastic uh, stethoscope and the scalpel and the syringe. And so they want to become doctors. We make them love this profession, being a doctor. And they go around giving surgery all the time, giving people shots, right? Then we buy them that little kit that has the, the nightstick, the gun, handcuffs and a badge. And they walk around wanting to hit people over the head, you know. You have the right to, uh, okay. So we make them love that profession. We give them the fireman hat, the axe. They love that. How many times and how many parents made their children love wanting to be like a scholar or an imam? And I always say this, I would love one day after Jum'ah prayer, a father will put his son or his daughter up on the mimbar and say, look, you're the sheikh now. Yallah, speak to the people, give people a khutbah. And we don't do things like that. We make them love every other pro profession. So his mother, rahimahullah, she made him love to want to become a scholar. And then he became the great Imam Malik, the one that we're talking about today, you know, hundreds of years after his death. Had he become a singer, you think we'd be talking about him today? Nobody would know anything about him, who he was or anything like that. So, uh, I mean, this is an example of fantastic mother. And many times we have uh, mothers and the majority of their concern basically studies. You know, the boy studies and that's about it. Yeah? And uh, basically there's a, there's a joke about this boy. And he was fooling around and playing the whole year. And then just uh, three or four days before the exam, he starts to study for the exam. And while he's studying for the exam, his mother is making dua, may Allah give you the passing grade, my son, may Allah give you success and everything. So then he takes the exams and after a, a week or two, the results come back and he failed. He failed everything. So he comes back very angry with his mother. He says, it's all your fault. You're playing all year long and then the last few days you want to make dua for me. <laughs> so what happened to the timer today? Okay. Put you on the spot, huh? The timer. I can't hear you, but that's no problem. Two minutes? Fantastic, Ah, uh, 22. Oh, I thought it was two. I was like, I'm out of here. Fantastic. Okay, you know something? Um, they asked me to share an example of a contemporary role model. And, and I want to talk about one, one scholar uh, in our times in particular. Zakallah khair, thank you very much. So I want to talk about a scholar in our times in particular because uh, first of all, he is still alive, Hafizahullah. And a lot of people may not know him, uh, but uh, yani a lot of du'at and, uh, and scholars and students of knowledge are very well aware of who he is. But I wanted especially the young men and women in the audience to be aware of this person. So I want to talk about uh, Sheikh and Dr. Ja'far, Sheikh Idris. His name is Ja'far Idris. And this has nothing to do with the fact that he's from Sudan. Nothing. I'm serious, nothing. Um, like I said, a lot of the young generation may not know who he is. And uh, th this is someone that, uh, and I don't think I've ever spoken publicly about this, but this is someone that, that I would like to be like, and I see him as a role model. And he impresses me very much for a number of reasons. First of all, there is, uh, يعني, you find different types of scholars. There are some scholars that just focus focus on memorization and they've retained tons and tons of information and they can just let it loose at any minute, right? And, and sometimes they, they're 
certain people who have retained and memorized so much information, but in the end, they can't give you the fruits and the benefits out of that. And they can't formulate a perfect answer for you from all, the, all this knowledge that they've memorized. So realistically, it's not about memorization and retaining information. At some, at some point, it's not about that. And uh, Sheikh Jafar Idris is one of those people that uh, basically he's, he's a thinker and he contemplates a lot. So let's start from the beginning. And, and you know, uh, he was telling me how he got his PhD. He has a PhD in philosophy. And he's one of the few people who went through philosophy and he's still sane. A lot of times people go through that and they're a little weak, wacky and weird, you know, but he's still sane and he got his PhD in philosophy. So he told me how he got it. You know, how you write a book for your PhD. He said, uh, and he, he's uh, the professor working with him, who's a, a British man. He said, I wrote a 60 page introduction to my book. When the professor read it, he gave me the PhD right then and there. It was that deep, it was that phenomenal that the professor, he just said, that's it. And he gave him the PhD right then and there. He said, I didn't like that. He was a young man, I didn't like that idea and I kept saying no. I, and he insisted, he refused the PhD and insisted on writing the book. He said later on, I suffered so much writing that book and I regret not taking the PhD right then and there. But it's, he's that brilliant. Yani in, in 60 pages, the man says, look, take it, that's it. And if any of you have read some of his, uh, he's got some, some yani writings on the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if he doesn't dumb it down, for lack of a better term, most people will not have a clue what it's talking about. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, I remember one time he was telling us how when he was a, a, a young man, one time he, he got beaten in school. Yani the, he got whipped as a punishment in school. These the good old days, you know. Now you touch a kid and like, oh, it's abuse. <laughs> Five across the face, that's a good, those were the good days. Anyways, so I thought, well, this is great. Yani at least this story will make him human. Maybe he misbehaved through a rock somewhere, you know. And I was like, what happened, Isha? I said, well, uh, this uh, one of the teachers said something sardonic, yani sarcastic about the Prophet Sallallahu And I responded to him in class severely. And uh, unfairly, I was punished because the, the teacher lied and this and that happened. But I got the punishment. We were like, okay, we were hoping for like rocks through a window and stuff, but yeah, it's something to make the sheikh human, right? <laughs> okay, uh, you know something? Again, uh, you can memorize information and in the end you have bad akhlaq. So what, what's the value of you memorizing information? Who wants, who wants to get it out of you anyways when you're rude and you're arrogant? And the thing I love about the sheikh is his humility, extremely, extremely humble. Uh, one, of the, one of the famous speakers and scholars in, uh, in America, he said, the first time I saw Sheikh Jafar Idris, he was playing volleyball with the youth. And he was an old man. Yani. He said, I just saw him for the first time, he was playing volleyball with the youth. He said, I said to myself, I want to become a Sheikh like that. Very, very humble man. And he used to hang out with us in Virginia, we'd have kebabs and things like that, and very humble. He speaks humble, he dresses humble. You know, sometimes a guy memorizes two hadith, he comes in a ghutra and bisht and stuff. And like, Excuse me, who are you? Like, are you the Mahdi or something? Or, why are you overdressed like that? You know? So he's always dressed humble. And so because he was so humble and he doesn't use like big words in his lectures, just keeps it simple. Everyone understands it and everyone enjoys it. I'm going to tell you about his lectures in a little bit. But he always kept it simple. You know? and, and some people, they try to impress you with big, long English words. Elephant, hippopotamus, you know? Trying to make things, you know, like they're all, you know, well-read and stuff. So... The, the Shabab thought, you know, Sheikh Jafar, you know, he's, he's knowledgeable, he gives us these nice classes and nice observations in the, in the Quran. But they didn't think he was top notch, right? Because he's just humble, he hangs out with us and stuff. Till one of the brothers went to Hajj, and Sheikh Jafar Idris was in the group, in, in his tent, basically, the group. And he said, I would, I would leave Sheikh Jafar's tent and walk around to visit these famous scholars that we've been reading their books for years and lectures and everything. He said, I would go to meet them. And he said, the minute they found out that Sheikh Jafar was in my tent or my group, they would stop what they're doing. And they would go all the way to his tent and kiss his forehead and then come back to what they were doing. So he comes back, he's like, Sheikh Jafar is like heavy stuff. And, and you know, we just, we have kebab with him. We joke with him, you know, and we think, you know, he's not way up there. But you know, when he goes uh, to, to Riyadh in Saudi, 
and you, the, the, the number of people that come and consult with him on issues and so on and so forth, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it يعني, from the humility of the Shaykh Hafizahullah. And yeah, Allah, يعني, just I'll spare you some of the horror stories. But I've met some people so knowledgeable, so rude, so rude. There was this guy we traveled with for 25 days. Allah, this man was so rude. Just incredible. But why are you memorizing things? Why did you memorize the Quran? Why did you learn to tafsir? Why did you learn about the akhlaq of the Prophet? If you're going to be like this in the end, and you, you see that <laughs> both sides of the spectrum, extremely rude, and you see someone very, very humble. So, um, <clears throat> he used to teach a class, and I don't know if you know, know anything about Virginia. There, was, uh, يعني, there were more scholars per square inch in Virginia than any other place in North America. Because we had all kinds of institutes, all kinds of scholars, like heavy-hitting scholars, big names, you know, heavy-duty scholars. And there, was an, there were a number of institutes there. And Sheikh Jafar Idris had a class in his home, in his basement, where he taught the deep, difficult, philosophical works of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. Deep, deep stuff. And he would sit in a chair, and top scholars would sit on the floor. Major scholars would sit on the floor and, they would, and he would give that class. So we had this friend of ours and he's you know, fairly knowledgeable. He studied in Arabic his entire life. So he says to the Sheikh, Sheikh, I would like to come to the class. Sheikh said, you can come, but you cannot ask any questions. He says, you know, I wanted to see this high level Islamic class, what it's like. He said, and he's telling me, he says, well, I went to the class and I'm sitting there thinking, what, what religion is this? He said, I had no clue what they were talking about. He said, I had no clue. I didn't understand anything. It was that deep, really, really deep stuff. So one description that one of the Mashaykh gave of Sheikh Jafar Idris is really amazing. And I'm going to tell you where, how he got all this, okay? Basically, um, he, he gave him a nice description. He said, the Sheikh will see the blind spots that no one else can see. Just like when you're driving, there's that blind spot. The car approaching behind you. There's there's this moment where you can't see it. It's there, but you can't see it. It's there, but you can't see it. So the Sheikh will give you things in the Quran that are these virtual blind spots for you. It was right there in front of your own eyes for years and you could never see it. And when he would comment on the Quran, it was absolutely amazing. Look, for the most part, most scholars and mashaykh you meet in your life, they tell you something and you can get it from a book. And there are very few people in the world that will tell you things and you cannot find it in any book. That's why I wanted to talk about Sheikh Jafar Idris. Okay? That's why he's my role model. And he can tell you something, you won't find it in any book. It's his contemplation. An angle that you never realized in the ayah and the ayah was in front of you for years. Really incredible. So how did he get to this point? Basically, he always, always contemplates the Quran. He always contemplates the Quran. And by the way, he memorized the Quran at a late, late age he was an old man when he memorized the entire Quran and and we're not going to because yani, I don't want to overpraise him yani, but from the night prayers and things like that we'll just uh, put that aside but he always contemplates the Quran I remember one time we we're at there in, in his home and it was time for Dhuhr prayer and so we are about to get ready for the Salah we stood up and then we we're going to call another one of his sons and it was basically he told one of his sons to go call the other one it was going to call take six or eight seconds basically he's gonna walk to the stairway and yell out his name and come back and that he'll take what 30 seconds to come down in this meantime the sheikh when he sat down on the couch there was a mushaf next to him he grabbed it and opened it and started to look through it always contemplating the Quran it was said that a group of students this was a story concerning Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah a group of students came to Sheikh bin Baz rahimahullah and they said what should we do he said memorize uh, the Quran Okay, after that, what should we do? He gave him some books of hadith to memorize. They said, after that, what should we do? He said, contemplate the Quran. Then they said, and after that? And the sheikh just smiled. You understand? You're never done contemplating the Quran, ever. Ever, you look at a verse again and again and again. You look at the tafsir of a surah again and again, and then something happens and you just see an angle you never saw from it. You know, even Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, he he used to tell the students when you, when you read an ayah, you're studying tafsir, he said, read the verse and think to yourself first, what does it mean? Then read the tafsir, just to open up these channels. Taban, this is not a, a gateway for people to, to invent and make bid'ah. Yani. Just contemplate first, what do you think it's saying? And then read the tafsir, right? 
So the Sheikh would always contemplate the Quran and you can never stop end or finish contemplating the Quran. I mean, it will always make sense and there will always be meanings and ways to understand it for generation after generation after generation. It just never ends. So he always contemplated the Quran. This was one of his secrets, and one of his, uh, and he, the, the, the secrets to, as to why he was like that, that he could see these blind spots. Because you spend so much time with the ayat, then you start to see them in a different light, in a different way. One of the things I love about the Sheikh, he's never afraid to say, I don't know. Never afraid to say it. I've heard him say it multiple times. Even if it's simple, a simple question, he'll say, I don't know. And he'll just say it very casually. And I always tell people, your best friend is, I don't know. Your best friend. If anybody asks you, who's your best friend, you say? That, just say, I don't know. Well, you don't have a best friend? Are you some kind of, I don't know. That's your best friend. You know how people, when they IM each other and text each other, they always write IDK. It's weird, right? What, what does that mean? See, nobody knows. Every time I ask, nobody knows. <laughs> that was a lame joke for those who do. <laughs> What did you yell out? I'll see you outside later on. Okay, uh, so basically he says, always says, I don't know. Most people now, subhanAllah, and this was also a description given of Ibn Baz, that uh, people would come and they would start to tell him a hadith and the shaykh would react as if he never heard the hadith before. They tell him the hadith one time, the Prophet was walking with Mu'adh ibn Jabal and then he said, and then the shaykh would be saying, subhanAllah, Subhanallah, beautiful, like as if he just heard it now for the first time. You know, how do we react now when someone tries to tell us a hadith that we know? Yeah, we finish it for them, right? Yeah, yes, yes, and then the Prophet said, And then uh, there's actually the narration in Muslim says it this way, and the one in Bukhari says it that way. So like, oh, I know, don't tell me. I know, you're not going to tell me. I'll finish the hadith for you, my friend. I'll translate it for you into Urdu if you want. You know? But Sheikh would just like very humble as if he heard it for the first time. And so Sheikh Jafar would never be afraid to say, I don't know. He would say it and not even look at people's eyes. Khalas, what's the big deal? If I don't know, I don't know. Where do you want me to get it from? You know, if I don't know, khalas. You remember when the man traveled from the, from the west of uh, from Al-Maghrib يعني, and came all the way to Imam Malik, traveling for days. He says, I have these questions. And the Imam says, look, tomorrow we'll try to give you the answer. Then the next day he comes and he says, I don't know the answer to these questions. He said, I came from a people who were saying, no one on earth is more knowledgeable than you. What do I go back and tell them? He said, go back and tell them I don't know. He says, then who will know it if you don't know it? He says, Allah, the one whom Allah has taught, you'll know it. <laughs> and so even poor people like me, sometimes someone will come and ask me a question. And then I say, I don't know the answer to that. You know what they do? They rephrase the question. You know, it's not like I'm going to say, oh, now I got it. You, now that you said it like that, it just came to me. Yeah, I don't know the answer. Yeah, they say it one more time slowly. I'm not stupid. I just don't know the answer. Okay? It's so hard for some people to say, I don't know. We even make a fatwa before saying, يعني, we, يعني, we, we give a, like a, how uh, is like, like the little caption when you, the fine, fine print. يعني. And Muhim. A warning, يعني like a little kind of a, a warning before we give the fatwa. So look, uh, Allahu Alam, and I don't want to give fatwa, and then they give you the fatwa. Why did you just say I don't know? Some people, it's just a game for them anymore. And one time the sheikh came to speak at the university. So a brother said, I want to go ask the sheikh a question. The brother said, ask me. Another brother said, ask me. Uh, he said, no, I want to ask the sheikh. He said, let me try. What is this, a game or something? You want to try it? What? Try what? And speaking about Allah without knowledge is something very serious. And sometimes people think, well, I'm a big sheikh and look at the audience here. How can I say I don't know in front of all these people? He said, I don't know. So the sheikh would do that. And that's another great thing. And that's something that I believe I, I learned from him as well. And, and I'll end by saying that he had uh, also, um, I've, I've never met anyone who had an understanding of the West, okay? and the, the history and the philosophies and the things that, that built and created the West better than Sheikh Jafar Idris ever. And extremely knowledgeable in that area. And like I said, his comments are just incredible. So how did he get to become like that? Because um, something about how you become a role model yourselves. 
And how did he become like that? It basically comes down to time. It's all about time and what you do with your time. And if you basically, uh, let, me, let me introduce you to what I call mini suicides, okay? This is you committing suicide. Because let me tell you something, your life, what is your life? It's time. It's minutes that add up to hours, that add up to days, that add up to weeks, that add up to months, that add up to years. That's you, your life. So you're sitting here, this is your life now. And you're giving up a part of your life, but you're doing it and you're spending it in a good way, alhamdulillah. So what's a mini suicide then? Here's a mini suicide. And I don't want to be too harsh here. Sitting on a couch, okay, and let's just add potatoes for comedic value. Sitting on a couch, eating potatoes, watching television. That's mini suicide. You just killed two hours of your life. You just killed yourself for two, for two hours. True or false? And what do you just watch uh, uh, Justin Barber gyrating around for a few minutes? And, but you just killed two hours of your life. That was a mini suicide. You know when you watch TV, what's happening? You are sitting down watching other people move. You are sitting in one place watching other people do action, do work. And you're just being amazed by them achieving. That's what TV is. You sit and you're amazed at other people who achieve and you're eating chips. It's sad. Many suicides. We kill ourselves every day, a couple of times a day. We kill ourselves with the internet, we kill ourselves with television. Take advantage of time because it's your life. So anyways, I'll end here. Jazakum Allah khairan, sallallahu wa barakatuh, Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.